Well, good morning uh, to all of you. Thank you for joining us. This is Jim Menker. I am the Director of Business Development for the CSAC Finance Corporation. And just want to thank you for joining us this morning for an incredibly important topic, uh, timely as well. Um, we are joined by uh, one of our partners at CSAC, the CSCDA, and just have been tremendous partners with them for years uh, since their inception and, and just thankful and, and really um, just glad that they're a, a partner of ours. And, and you'll see as the webinar uh, you know, progresses, uh, the expert um, analysis that John Pencower will give. So I want to welcome you, John, and thank you for your expertise and partnership as well. Um, it's really great to have you here and you'll hear from John here in a few minutes. Um, I also want to recognize um, the host of today's webinar and another partner of ours, ILG, and Melissa. It's great to have you, and you'll hear from Melissa here in a, in a minute. But we work um, <coughs> throughout, <coughs> excuse me, throughout the uh, year <coughs> together on projects like these webinars. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. I don't know what happened to me. <laughs> uh -oh. No problem. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Jim mentioned, my name is Melissa Keene. I'm a senior program manager with the Institute for Local Government, and we are happy to be part of this conversation and this webinar this morning uh, in conjunction with CSAC and CSCDA. Um, I'm just going to cover a couple of housekeeping things and then share a little bit about ILG in case you aren't familiar with us and how we can be a resource for you all. Um, but just a few logistics to get us started. Um, first, you've probably realized that your lines have been muted. Um, and will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but that doesn't mean you can't ask us questions at any point throughout um, this morning's conversation. You all should see a questions box in your control panel, um, and so uh, please type questions into that box at any point in time during the webinar. Um, we'll be pausing about at midpoint, and then um, we will also have time held at the end of today's conversation to, to answer your questions um, as many as we can. Um, so please use that functionality. Um, we're also recording this webinar, um, so we'll be distributing that recording as well as the slide deck um, to everybody who registered for this webinar after um, we're done today. So just a little bit of information about um, the Institute for Local Government in case you're not uh, familiar with us. Um, as Jim mentioned, we are an affiliate of CSAC, um, but we also are affiliated with the League of California Cities and the California State Association of Counties. So we provide practical and easy to use resources so local agencies can effectively implement policies on the ground. Go to the next slide. So we do this in a variety of, of, uh, of ways. We do a lot of education and training, such as um, webinars with our partners like this one. We also provide technical assistance and capacity building um, and do a lot of convening uh, services as well for our local government partners. We focus on four main pillar areas. Um, we have a program around leadership and governance that hits a lot of the um, mandated trainings and legal information and governance information that you all need as local officials and staff. Uh, we have a program around civics education and workforce that helps create a pipeline to public service and really um, facilitate municipal school partnerships and uh, just help encourage young folks to go into local government as a career path. We have an entire program focused on public engagement um, helping local agencies embed public engagement into their operations, um, really facilitate meetings, um, design meetings, especially in this virtual environment, and we have a lot of resources on that front. And then lastly, we have a program focused on sustainable communities. Um, so this year, um, we're doing a lot of work around housing, and so um, related to this topic, if you have interest in more resources or more training on um, housing topics, um, definitely check out our website that you see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and we have a, a full host of free, free resources and free webinars for all of you to take advantage of as well. So with that, um, thank you again for joining us this morning. And I will turn it over to John Penkower for our presentation. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Jim, uh, for that introduction. And good morning to everybody participating today. Um, I know you all have very busy schedules uh, right now. So thanks for say, taking some time. Uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, CSCDA's uh, newest uh, innovative financing program. Uh, I'm going to start with just a brief background uh, on CSCDA for those that may be a little less familiar. Um, the California Statewide Communities Development Authority, uh, CSCDA, is the largest joint powers authority uh, in the state of California, 
and was created back in 1988 uh, as a result of cooperation between the League of California Cities and CSEC, um, also uh, the sponsors of, of ILG uh, today. And we exist uh, to create and implement innovative financing tools for our city and county members for a variety of different projects um, throughout the state. Today, currently, we have 533 members uh, that are comprised of cities and counties and special districts. That's most, um, if not all, uh, throughout the state. And uh, we have programs uh, that provide health care, affordable housing, infrastructure, um, and we, we have issued in excess of $65 billion in bonds for these programs uh, throughout the state of California. Um, this is a snapshot of um, some of our most active uh, financing programs that you may or, or may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, I'm going to briefly run through those. Um, the Cal Lease Program is an equipment uh, financing program uh, for cities and counties. Uh, TRIP, for some that may have participated, is a way to uh, uh, utilize uh, sales tax revenues uh, to make road improvements uh, within your communities. We do quite a bit of nonprofit financing uh, for 501c3s, from your largest hospitals uh, down to private schools and some of your uh, you know, smallest community-based organizations. Let's skip over affordable housing for a minute. Uh, we do exempt facility bonds uh, for solid waste, airports, and, and other facilities. And then in the infrastructure space, uh, we operate two innovative programs. Uh, the first is called the Statewide Community Infrastructure Program, or SCIP. And this is a way to finance development impact fees and other public infrastructure uh, for cities and counties. Uh, it's a great tool. It's being utilized very widely uh, today. Um, and we'd be happy to talk more about uh, that program with you uh, if you have interest. And then we do standalone community facilities district financing uh, for those single larger projects. We operate a new markets tax credit program. Uh, for projects um, in uh, lower income census tracts uh, throughout the state. We are the largest issuer of uh, PACE bonds, property assessed clean energy bonds, uh, both in the residential and the commercial sector. Uh, and then today what we're talking about is our new workforce housing program for middle and moderate income families. So our largest financing program is affordable housing. And we've been doing that uh, since the mid nineties uh, throughout the state. Uh, these are your traditional affordable housing projects uh, that are utilized in tax credits and private activity bonds. Um, we've issued um, about 900 projects and nearly 100,000 units uh, throughout the state. These projects are limited to individuals generally earning uh, less than 50 or 60 percent of the area median income. And so that is your very low and low uh, income demographics. Um, those tools um, that are available to that uh, lower and very low uh, income projects are tax credits, money from HCD at the state, um, home funds, other local city and county funds uh, that are made available in order to make those projects work. What we found though, is that once you get above 60 to 80% of AMI, there are no tools left. Um, you may have heard the term the missing middle, uh, this is that middle income demographic uh, where salaries, income has not um, risen at the same rate as we've seen rents rising uh, in many parts uh, of the state. Um, missing middle is generally those individuals uh, that they earn too much to afford traditional subsidized housing. Uh, those projects for 50 and 60 percent AMI, but not necessarily enough. Uh, to afford to live in the communities where they're currently working. And so therefore, uh, it leads to uh, very long commutes um, and other societal problems that arise as a result of that. We use the term workforce housing uh, in our program. Um, there's another, a lot of different names for that. There's middle income housing, moderate income housing. Uh, these are generally individuals earning between 60% of AMI and 120% AMI. Um, it's a very wide demographic. Uh, city and county employees may qualify, um, firefighters, police officers, other first responders, teachers, um, and, uh, you know, other just employees working in communities throughout the state um, that, um, you know, again, are in that middle demographic 
um, where they don't qualify for other forms of subsidized housing. Um, as I mentioned, there's no subsidies that we're aware of uh, that are available uh, to this income demographic. We may, we often see inclusionary housing requirements where for a market rate project, uh, there may be a requirement to have 10 units or even 10% of the units restricted, um, but nothing where you're actually restricting units um, for an entire project uh, for middle income residents. We've been working on this program for a couple of years now. Um, and while CSCDA is traditionally a conduit issuer, uh, meaning we don't own the assets uh, and we're not issuing our own debt, but we're issuing debt on behalf of a particular project, um, under this program, CSCDA, or rather its affiliate, Joint Powers Authority, will acquire um, existing multifamily assets, market rate assets, um, existing apartment buildings, um, or newly created new, new construction apartment buildings and record a regulatory agreement and then restrict those rents um, and the rent increases and the eligibility uh, for the missing that those earning between 60 and 120 percent uh, of AMI. And we do that uh, through the issuance of governmental bonds. Um, there's no other subsidies uh, involved. There's no equity. There's no other funding sources. Um, every, the project the entire acquisition uh, is financed through CSCDA issuance of governmental bonds. The city or county where the project is located, and we call that the host jurisdiction, um, they will participate uh, by essentially agreeing to receive all the future surplus uh, accrued equity in the project. So think of it as uh, when the bonds are repaid, the value of that project will flow back to the city or the county. And we do that through a document called the Public Benefit Agreement. Uh, this is the only document that the city or the county is a party to, and uh, it doesn't impose any obligations on the part of the city or county, um, but all of the, the future benefits. You may be asking, uh, well, can a city or county do this uh, themselves? And we do get that question uh, quite a bit. And th the answer is you could. Uh, what we have found is uh, most public agencies uh, they don't want to own more property. In fact, many have been divesting uh, their affordable assets um, to the private sector or to nonprofits or other type of public-private partnership. If the city or county wanted to do this directly, they would be putting the asset on their balance sheet. Uh, they would be pledging their credit rating, um, and then also, you know, essentially be in that line of liability fire, if you will. So the way that we structured this program is to provide all of the benefits to the city or county as far as affordable affordability levels and all of the future upside, the financial upside in the project, um, but without having to do it themselves um, or be, um, you know, liable um, or have, you know, other unmitigated risks in connection with the ownership. So this slide describes the participation. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 533 city and county members. Um, I'm guessing most of you um, on the webinar today are current CSCDA members. And so the process for participating in this program is, is pretty easy. Um, I mentioned that there's an affiliate joint powers authority that owns these projects. And, and that's simply for uh, tax reasons. Um, it's managed by CSCDA. It has the same CSCDA commission members. Um, but the city or county would adopt a single resolution opting into this program. And it, we're, it, essentially that they agree to be a member of the Affiliate Joint Powers Authority, and then they will also agree to the public benefit agreement. And this document I described uh, just ties the project back to the city or county and provides that, that future uh, you know, financial benefit. Um, there's no costs uh, associated with the program uh, there's no additional responsibilities uh, on behalf of any city or county uh, in connection with any of the projects. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and uh, see if we have any questions, and then we can proceed with uh, the remainder uh, of the slides. Yes, so we do have a couple of questions that we've seen come in. Um, but this is also a good time to remind everybody that um, if you have additional questions as we go throughout the presentation or right now, 
um, please feel free to put those into the questions box you see on your control panel. Um, but let's uh, dive into the few questions that we have already. Um, so the first question, John, is uh, what risks, um, if any, are there to participating uh, to a participating city or county? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably one of the most important questions that we regularly get uh, from our participants. And I started talking a little bit about that, is that the program is designed to minimize um, you know, most, if not all, risks to the city or county. Uh, they're not, they don't own the properties. Um, they're not a party to the transaction documents. Um, they're not a party to the regulatory agreement. And uh, so risks are very minimal. One thing that I haven't mentioned yet is how do we create this subsidy when none exists? And it is a function of property tax exemption and then also being able to issue tax exempt bonds. And so when CSCDA acquires properties, um, much like uh, a city or county uh, or nonprofit owning property, they would be exempt uh, from ad valorem property taxes. Um, as far as risks, if there were ever a default, um, that would not be reflect in any way on, on behalf of uh, the city uh, or the county. Uh, these bonds are sold to essentially to mutual funds, to uh, sophisticated institutional investors um, that take uh, the risks with respect to the project. That being said, um, these are probably the safest, um, asset, you know, uh, financing structured asset in, in, in within the you know, community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. They require expensive reserves, um, and, and these are reserves that are required by the bond investors, um, and they're much, much higher than you would typically see uh, in a, um, a commercial transaction. Um, I think that if there was a total, just to be candid, if there, were, there would have to be a total collapse of, um, you know, um, multifamily, um, you know, um, multifamily rentals. Uh, within any particular community uh, for that to happen. Uh, and so you know, the cities and, and the folks that have participated so far um, have identified that risk is very minimal to them. Great. I have another question that came through, John. Um, are there minimum or maximum project sizes uh, in this program? Yes, there, there are. That's, that's also an important question. So. This is a capital markets execution. And so I mentioned we're funding the entire project with the issuance of tax exempt bonds. So that, that doesn't come from a traditional bank, whether small or large. Um, we are working with a, an underwriter, uh, an investment bank. Uh, we're currently working with a number of them, including Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, uh, Stiefel, others that you probably see regularly um, out there throughout the state. They are underwriting and, and marketing and selling the bonds uh, to investors. So there is a minimum size uh, for this specific uh, program. Um, ideally, it, the unit mix would be in the 150 to 200 units and higher. Um, and then from an acquisition cost, probably in the 65 to $70 million range. Um, at the higher end, there, there's no maximum uh, limitation for projects. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a couple more questions I'm seeing. Um, are there, is there any flexibility in the affordability level for projects with this, under this program? There is. So the middle income demographic is going to vary depending on the community that you're in. And so um, while we focus projects on 80 to generally 80% below, 100% AMI below, and 120% below, uh, there is flexibility. You may encounter a community where rents are um, extraordinarily high, uh, where market uh, rents are at that high end of that spectrum. So there is flexibility from a legal and tax standpoint um, to adjust those levels up and down. That's a good question. Got one more here. Uh, does the city or county have to own the property after the bonds are repaid? Uh, no, they don't. Um, and in fact, most I haven't come across uh, any uh, that would be interested in that. And so we, that's why we've structured this public benefit agreement 
to provide the city or county with a menu of options, if you will. The city or county uh, has complete discretion over the disposition of the property. And under the terms of the public benefit agreement, beginning in year 15, these are typically 30 year bonds, but beginning in year 15, a city or county could force a sale of that property. Or they could choose not to in a way 30 years when the bonds have been repaid. They can direct CSCDA to sell the property to a third party. They could own it if they would want to. Um, they could refinance uh, the property. Um, we, we think one of the most attractive disposition options is to have the property sold to a nonprofit, retain the affordability and perpetuity, and also still be able to pull out all of the accrued equity uh, from that project. And we're gonna go through a case study and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. Perfect, um, so that's all the questions I'm seeing at this point in time. Um, just another friendly reminder to everybody on the line to feel free to drop any questions you have into the, the questions panel and we'll get to more questions um, at the close of the presentation. Um, but I'll turn everything back over to John at this point. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, those were they're great, great questions. So the next slide here talks about uh, who's involved in one of these transactions. Um, the city or the county, uh, they are the host jurisdiction, and they simply agree to receive uh, the revenue from the project um, at that time period between 15 years and 30 years. Um, you have a project sponsor, and so CSCDA is working with a number of different groups. Uh, we currently have five sponsor groups, and these are uh, existing multifamily, either affordable or market rate or both, uh, developers and owners, um, many of which we work with every day on our affordable projects, and they have relationships with the current institutional owners uh, of these properties. They're market rate properties, so they're not currently restricted. Uh, they can be sold to anyone. Um, and they will take the, the pursuit risk, if you will, to acquire a property. And then they assign that purchase and sale agreement over to CSCDA at the closing of the transaction. You have a property seller, so uh, a current owner of a property that's interested in selling. These are often off-market transactions. So it is a, uh, an owner uh, that may be going out to market in the next year or so um, and is willing to uh, sell the property into this program. You have the Joint Powers Authority, that's us. Uh, we are the owner of the property. And then you have an ongoing property administrator. And that's typically the same firm as the sponsor. So the sponsor will acquire the project and they will remain involved and administer that asset uh, throughout the life of the bond. Um, I mentioned this slide already, um, so we, we have multiple underwriters on the program and multiple sponsors uh, that have uh, pretty uh, unbelievable access to both the capital markets and uh, projects all throughout the state. The next slide here shows uh, where we've been and where we're going uh, with this program. The first project was in the city of Carson. Uh, that was 150 units, and that closed uh, late last year in December. We have completed three acquisitions in the city of Anaheim for a total of 1,000 units, and those projects closed uh, late last year, and then the third project just closed a couple weeks ago. We have a project in the city of Long Beach that is closing next week uh, for a little more than 200 units, and we're going to talk specifically about that project here uh, in the next slide. And we have a project in the city of Monrovia that is actually going out uh, tonight or tomorrow, the marketing phase of the bonds. And that project will be closing here in a couple weeks. And we have projects in Glendale. Um, we have other projects all throughout Northern and Southern California. Some of the Northern California um, jurisdictions will start coming along um, pretty quickly, um, both small and large uh, communities. Uh, we have uh, north of a billion dollars in pipeline right now uh, that will be closing here um, by the end of the first half of this year. So now I'm going to talk about a case study. I mentioned the Long Beach project um, that uh, will be closing here next week. This is a newly constructed asset. 
um, in, in the city. Uh, it was just completed uh, last year, and uh, it's in the process of uh, completing its lease up. And uh, Lennar, uh, you may be familiar with, one of the largest home builders and multifamily builders, um, built it and is selling the project uh, as the initial builder owner uh, into the CSCDA program. Long Beach, um, in looking at their RENA goals, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, RENA credit um, after this slide, uh, they had a real problem in the moderate income category. And uh, this, this cycle that um, is just ending, um, they needed uh, roughly 1,400 units of moderate income housing, and they had uh, about 37 total units. Um, as I mentioned early on, there's, there really are no tools. Uh, in order to get uh, moderate income housing built. Uh, it, it's, it's quite difficult to get developers uh, to build, um, especially with um, rising construction cost regulation, and to be able to restrict those rents uh, voluntarily. In the next arena cycle, Long Beach needs 4,000 units of moderate income housing, and that's the next eight-year cycle that's now starting. So for this project, uh, the units at or below 80% of AMI were very important to the city. And so we were able to underwrite that project and structure the regulatory agreement so that 40% of those units within the property would be restricted to individuals earning less than 80% of AMI. That's technically still the highest end of the low income category. And then the remainder of the units you see there are at 100% AMI and below and then 120% below. The rent increases. So what's important about this program is that when you put the regulatory agreement on, you're also capping future rent increases. Uh, the new state rent control law today is 5% per year plus CPI. And so think of that more as 7 or 7.5%. 7 Under this program, the maximum rent increase would be 4%. It's actually the lesser of 4% increase in market rent and increase in AMI. So if market rents haven't increased or AMI levels haven't increased, uh, the, the rents would not even move into that 4% uh, increase uh, category. We talked about property taxes, so which are important to, to cities and counties, um, especially today. And that is how we are creating this program. In the case of Long Beach, uh, it was roughly $350,000 a year in lost property taxes uh, for this particular project. But in the year one, the aggregate rental savings for the tenants occupying this project were estimated to be $1.4 million, which obviously eclipsed the loss in property tax and uh, the policymakers at the city determined that uh, this is providing significant public benefit to their residents and entered into uh, the program. And last, and these are really the three important numbers, property tax loss, um, rental savings um, for the residents, and that number will grow. Um, and then what is the future value that's going to go back to the city or county? And, and it's, it's pretty tremendous, as you can see here. So in year 15, we estimate that $93 million in equity would be available um, back to the city and, and other taxing agencies. Um, and then year 30, when the project, when all of the bonds are estimated to be paid off, um, north of $200 million, which can go back into a city or county's affordable housing programs, or it could just go back into the general fund. Think of it as a city or county investing short-term property tax loss in generally class A assets uh, within their community for uh, a pretty significant return on investment uh, down the road. I mentioned reserves earlier, and I'll just take a minute to talk about that as well. Because we're financing uh, the entire project, the bond investors require pretty extensive reserves, reserves for debt service, for interest payments, um, and then also for capital improvements. And the, we call this the capital, uh, capital expenditure reserve. There will be initial contributions to that at closing, and then each year, uh, as rents come in, contributions per unit will go into that capital expenditure reserve so that uh, these properties can be maintained in their Class A shape. I mentioned earlier that there's no equity. Um, there are no private interests involved in this structure. In fact, you can't have those. 
um, from a, a tax perspective um, with the issuance of, of tax-exempt governmental bonds. And so you remove um, certain interests that may, may not be consistent uh, with the city's interest um, or with that of the property, meaning that you don't run into deferred maintenance. Um, you don't ever run into a current owner that is uh, probably going to sell the asset in five or seven years. Every dollar generated uh, can only go one of two places, either right back into the project or to pay down the principal of the bonds. Once the bonds are paid down, all of that benefit goes back to the city or county. And in the example of um, the one of our Anaheim projects, the last Anaheim project, we priced those bonds on a day that was uh, very attractive as far as interest rates uh, in the market. And instead of 30 years, those bonds are now anticipated to pay down, pay off rather, in 25 years. So that's just creating um, equity sooner uh, for that particular city. Um, so in summary, and then we'll get to some additional questions, um, this is a real innovative tool to addressing the missing middle uh, and creating additional affordable housing for that demographic that doesn't exist uh, really otherwise. There's no cost, little to no upfront cost. Um, there is property tax loss, uh, so I don't want to say uh, there's no cost, but from the administration standpoint, um, this doesn't require staff time um, or other contributions. Uh, there are protections for existing residents. So if it's an existing property, uh, there are no tenants that are displaced. And when units turn over, eligible tenants will move in and occupy them at those different income levels. Um, we think that most properties will turn over within two to three years. Um, but again, if there is a market rate tenant, uh, they wouldn't enjoy the lower rent, uh, but they would not be uh, displaced from the property. Uh, the projects are prop privately managed. And so in addition to that asset manager, uh, you will have your typical best-in-class property management company, like a uh, Graystar or an FPI or, or other type of, of, uh, of property manager. I mentioned the reserves. There's pretty significant protections that are built in to the financing structure. And then, um, as I also mentioned, uh, the property is held in trust for you, city and county, and uh, how that property is handled in the future is at the complete discretion of the city or county. In the case of the Long Beach example, you can see there are pretty significant uh, financial upsides uh, to those cities and counties uh, that are participating. And then lastly, I'll talk about RENA credit. So the current RENA regulations uh, never envisioned a program like this. You would get RENA credit for new construction. And for acquiring an existing asset, the current regulations provide credit only for those properties in the low and the very low um, brackets. And so there is not current law that provides credit for moderate income acquisitions. Uh, this is a problem. It's a problem for uh, those that have already participated uh, in the program, and we're taking steps right now to uh, amend that legislation um, with the assistance of both the League and CSAC, uh, our partners. Uh, we have a bill sponsor, and uh, we're very hopeful that this will get done uh, during the current session. And with that, um, I'd be happy to open it back up for any additional questions. All right. Thanks, John. Um, I do want to apologize to the attendees. There were a couple of questions that had come in um, in that last section that I missed. So um, we have a few questions in the queue here, but again, feel free to drop more in as we have this conversation. Um, so the first question we have, John, is how are projects selected within a given community? It, that, that's a good question. So this program works really well with newer construction. So think of post 2000, and for a couple of different reasons. There is, because we're holding this for at least 30 years, um, there are certain tax requirements uh, examining the useful life of that property. Um, it also enables us to plan for the capital improvements uh, for the future. So newer projects uh, work much better than an older, older value add type project, um, probably wouldn't work uh, as well. Um, on the underwriting side, uh, you're looking for projects where we can reduce the rents 
Investors are actually looking for, want to ensure that those rents are being reduced. And that's what gives them comfort. So in a downturn economy, these properties, because the rents are lower and restricted, uh, will be occupied um, sooner and greater uh, than an adjacent, you know, truly market rate uh, property. Our sponsor teams are really good at uh, looking through communities. Um, they know the current owners, uh, they know the brokers, and they're able to determine uh, what might be uh, a willing seller and, and also a project uh, that works. Ultimately, one of the, the program underwriters, uh, you know, will need to dig in uh, to the uh, assumed uh, pro forma for that project where they anticipate rents, where they're taking rents down to, and ensuring at the end of the day that the project can support the debt service. Uh, so a kind of related question, um, then you were talk mentioning newer properties are, are better uh, prospects. Can this be used for new construction? It, it can. And ultimately, that is our goal, uh, to be able to adapt this uh, well to new construction. We are in the process right now of looking at um, uh, some potential projects. We've looked at about a dozen so far. It is more challenging um, to do new construction projects uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, you, we trigger prevailing wage um, by having CSCDA uh, ownership similar to any other government entity. And that can be challenging uh, in certain communities uh, with construction costs. Um, and then additionally, we're issuing bonds throughout the entire period of construction. And so you will have some pretty significant carrying costs, uh, essentially capitalized interest uh, during that time period. Um, we're beholden to the capital markets. And while the interest rate environment has been very good, um, it is starting to widen a little bit. Uh, I noticed today that the market was selling off a bit. And so at, at certain rate levels, it's very challenging for us uh, to make this program work. That being said, uh, we're really um, actively, actively searching for that first guinea pig project, if you will. Um, and our underwriters uh, on the program um, have been spending a lot of time working through potential projects. We're very hopeful that that is going to be the next phase of this program. Uh, in that situation, so the second half of that question was um, if a developer, either a nonprofit or for profit, would be able to be a party to this. So, how would you work with developers in the instance that it would be a new construction project? Or would you? That's a great question. Um, so, yes, a, a developer, uh, if they're participating in the program for new construction, they would no longer own the property. And so, they would not uh, have equity in the property. Um, they would be participating as a fee developer, but they can stay on and administer the asset and, uh, you know, remain the asset administrator um, and just be compensated in a different manner than they were, uh, you know, the, the actual owner. But at the same time, then they don't have any equity um, that's tied up uh, in the project. And so it can still be attractive for, for developers that are looking for, um, you know, projects that might be able to have rents within this demographic. Right. Uh, so going back to uh, the conversation we were having about the best size project for this type of uh, financing, um, are there any future plans to accommodate more rural communities? So you had mentioned 150 units. Um, that obviously doesn't necessarily translate well to some of our smaller or more rural communities. Um, are there any plans to potentially um, adjust those parameters or any suggestions for smaller communities? Yeah, it's an important question. Um, this program is very new, um, as you can see. Right now, um, we are somewhat limited by this capital markets execution. Um, we've been having conversations about potentially pooling smaller projects together, and now there are inherent challenges with that um, as well, timing being uh, probably the most significant. Um, there are other tools um, that can be used uh, for smaller projects. I mentioned the welfare exemption. Uh, now, the welfare exemption provides a tax exemption for properties. It's used often for um, smaller projects, uh, even older projects. Now, those rents need to be limited to below 80% of the area median income. So it's part of the income demographic that we're talking about today. You can't get that above 80%. And in that case, um, a city or county would work directly with a private developer or a nonprofit 
um, and be able to provide that welfare exemption to that project so that they can provide the rent relief. So that's a separate program from what we're discussing today, um, but it is available. Um, just a side note, it's very challenging now to get uh, what we call volume cap or bond allocation, which is what we traditionally need for affordable housing projects. So you're seeing more developers um, seek out the welfare exemption in order to acquire, rehabilitate, and preserve the affordability of projects in communities small and large. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, from the audience, uh, essentially how would um, a city or county know if you're in, if you're in their community? Um, is there, like, so how are you soliciting acquisitions? How would they know if you're, um, if you're there? So again, most not, if not all are already members of CSCDA. Um, the program is really being driven by uh, opportunities with uh, current uh, owners. Um, much of that comes from our sponsor teams um, and, um, and the broker community um, who has a, you know, an understanding of, of what projects are out there. Um, I'm happy to talk offline with anybody participating today about potential opportunities within your community. Perfect. Um, and there, I, I believe your contact information is on the next slide. So if anybody wants to directly follow up with John um, with specific questions about their jurisdiction, that's probably the best way to do that. Um, so we do have a couple more questions here. Um, so why wouldn't a city or county be able to operate this kind of program by itself? Yeah, so um, I touched on that a little bit. Um, they could. Um, we're seeing most cities, um, a lot of cities, I'm guessing counties as well, not really want to be in the ownership business uh, anymore. Um, you've seen massive divestitures of existing affordable assets. Uh, but the shorter answer is you could. Um, but, uh, again, these projects would impact your credit rating. They would be on your balance sheet. And, and the city or county is then, um, you know, liable. Um, now, is it possible that you could still get phone calls in connection with these projects? Yes, but the city or county is not the owner. Um, they're not responsible for property management. And so we think that this provides all the benefits um, without uh, some of the more inherent risks by operating the program, um, the city or county itself. So this Great. sounds really, really good, John, but are there any downsides for uh, entities using uh, this program? None really. I, and we get that a lot. Well, this sounds too good to be true. Um, it's, uh, we, we've issued now uh, we will hit a billion dollars mark in just a couple of weeks. Um, the only, if you want to think of it as a downside, is, is that short-term property tax loss. And that is, uh, that's an important consideration for policymakers uh, in any city or county. And I mentioned those three numbers earlier. Uh, the rental savings should be significant and uh, well exceed what you're giving up in property taxes. And then the long-term investment, uh, you know, is really critical. Um, and it doesn't have to be used for affordable housing programs. Uh, you may be preparing for, you know, additional future pension liabilities uh, in the future. Um, so we, we really don't see uh, downsides uh, to the program, uh, you know, other than that evaluation of property tax loss. Seeing a couple more come through. Um, so this next question, John, is uh, CDFIs are creating their own opportunity funds, but there is a great need for integration into community planning and economic development at the city and county level. Um, is there anything on the horizon to bridge that gap? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely familiar. I know that I, the Opportunity Zone uh, program um, has been around for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm loosely uh, familiar with it, uh, just because it's operated by the same uh, CDFI fund that operates the New Markets Tax Credit Program, uh, to which we have a community development entity uh, that participates. Um, I'm not sure that that would be compatible with this specific program, 
Uh, I can tell you that it's becoming more and more challenging uh, to build housing at all different levels, from homelessness um, all the way to what we're discussing today. Um, we're trying to be clever, uh, throw ideas against the wall, talk to our partners, um, talk to um, the state um, with the debt limit allocation committee and the tax credit allocation committee, the governor's office and the treasurer's office. Um, over 30 years, CFCDA started just issuing industrial development bonds uh, in the late 80s and has evolved into uh, you know all the programs you've seen today. So. Um, we want to be at the forefront and uh, happy to discuss uh, you know, any other potential ideas where we could play a role um, for those of our members and uh, those of CSAC and the LEAD's members. Great, thank you. Um, we do have one question around a special assessment, but it sounds pretty fact specific. Um, so I might suggest if that's your question to reach out directly to John. Um, I have a feeling he might have some follow-up questions in order to actually answer that um, answer that question. So um, I would suggest I think that. I, I think I can take a stab at that question. Um, the property tax exemption uh, is just the one percent ad valorem tax. So for if there are special assessments, those get are continued to be paid uh, like a CFD or otherwise on the tax roll. Um, two of the projects in Anaheim. Um, had a CFD. Um, we actually ended up paying off those CFDs, um, that portion, um, because it was more attractive to the project. Um, but that was a 50-50 decision. And um, if not, uh, th those uh, uh, that portion of the property taxes would, would be continued to be paid. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one more question for you, John. Um, so this is something we're hearing a lot at from ILG's perspective, as we're working on housing issues, um, obviously RENA is a big um, challenge for a lot of our local government partners. Can you talk any more about the legislative fix um, to potentially get RENA credit um, that would be related to this program? Yes, that's happening in real time right now. Um, that language is just being introduced or maybe introduced in the next couple of days. And the goal there is that Cities or counties that are participating uh, in this type of program, it doesn't have to be CSCDA's program, um, but that if you're providing uh, moderate income housing through an acquisition, that you receive credit um, that would require ideally a 30 year regulatory agreement. At the low and the very low um, uh, income levels, it requires a 55 year covenant. And that's simply a cross reference to the 55 year covenant that's required from the state for tax credits and bonds. Um, in this case, since our regulatory agreement uh, runs with the bonds, which are typically 30 years, we're requesting that credit be provided to cities or counties um, that provide uh, rents within that 80 to 120 moderate category with a 30 year regulatory agreement. Um, we'll keep you updated. Um, we have, again, I mentioned, um, you know, the advocacy teams from both CSAC and the league at the forefront of this with, with us. And, um, you know, as the remaining months of this session, um, you know, roll out, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to have, uh, you know, exciting uh, information for all of you. So it sounds like a stay tuned for more on that front, hopefully. <laughs> exactly. It's um, stay tuned, but it's happening right now. Perfect. Uh, so that's all um, I've seen come through. We do have a few more minutes if there's any um, final burning questions from our audience. Um, otherwise, do you have any closing thoughts, John? Anything else you want to share with, with the group? I just want to thank everybody for taking time um, out of your day. Um, I know that everyone's workload uh, has gotten probably uh, you know, greater, more significant uh, during this last challenging year. So thanks for taking a little bit of time to learn about this program. Feel free to reach out uh, to us, uh, anyone at CSCDA, uh, or through your league and CSAC contacts if you have questions, if you have ideas. Um, CSCDA's greatest programs um, often come from ideas from our members. Um, and so again, uh, thanks for your time today. Perfect. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, we will be uh, sending a recording of this, e of this webinar as well as the slide deck around to um, all of you on the line as well as anybody who registered. So stay, um, keep your eye out for that. Um, and Jim, you want to close us out? Any final thoughts from CSAC? 
Well, once again, we want to thank our partnerships with ILG. Thank you, Melissa, for uh, your wonderful hosting today. And, and of course, the content that came through with John um, and CSCDA. Really uh, just appreciate you guys. Again, thanks for your time and uh, have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon.